Lovely to see everybody. Uh, I really hope I'm not too rusty because as it's a long time since we've been in the cathedral, it's a very long time since I've given a tour or a talk of the cathedral. So please do bear with me. I think I've um, sort of reminded myself of a lot of the facts. Um, and I've got this presentation, which is a fair few slides to um, go through. Um, and I'll try and be as descriptive as I can about the slides. So you know who I am, Jane McArdle. Um, heritage, freelance heritage person. Um, heritage isn't in, in a great place at the moment, as is a lot of other things. So I'm currently working um, as a teaching assistant in a local um, infant school. So I'm spending a lot of my days now with six year olds. So um, very different from what I was doing this time last year. So it's been lovely to reconnect with some of the cathedral heritage. Um, what I'm going to be sharing to you in this very much introduction to the heritage of Birmingham Cathedral are the things that I've found interesting um, and that I think other people have found interesting. It is by no account um, a full detailed survey of the cathedral's history. Um, just to give you an idea about what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the cathedral very much within its context because, um, as you're aware, we always look at the church that became a cathedral in a town that became a city and so very much seeing the growing town of Birmingham around it so the first part will be about how the town grew it'll be chronological and it will reflect mainly on the exterior of the cathedral um, I'm then going to talk about the churchyard after that I'll talk about the interior of the cathedral and some of the key changes that happened there um, and then at the very end, I'm just going to look at a few objects, um, a few of the treasures from the cathedral. Um, so let me just see if this works. And I just want to see if I can get a pointer to work as well. Yeah, can you see that pointer, everybody? Just give me a yes. thumbs up, lovely. Okay. So this is a, a superb picture that was taken by someone called Luna MacDonald in 20. 18 and she took it from one of the high office blocks um, nearby. Um, it was taken in April and if you look carefully you can just see the last little bits of the daffodil cross over here um, on this on this piece of lawn. Um, as you know the cathedral is a grade one listed building, it's in a conservation area um, and the area is also very much the business area of Birmingham, it's a really busy part of the city and the often quoted statistic that something like 20,000 people per day pass by um, the doors. So you know we get this idea of it being in a very busy thoroughfare. It was built between 1710 and 1725 uh, and was consecrated on the 5th of October 1715 and it was consecrated as the parish church of St Philip's. Um, in a nutshell it started as a parish church and then in 1905 it became a cathedral of the new diocese of Birmingham and it's regarded as the third smallest cathedral in the country. So in order to reflect on the kind of importance of the building, I thought it would be useful just to look at what some uh, architectural historians have said about St Philip's. Alexandra Redgwood is a big um, Pugin um, expert and she refers to it as a most subtle example of the elusive English Baroque. William Hutton, who was Birmingham's first historian, um, who remembers, uh, he was mainly writing in the early 19th century, and he remembers St Philip's as a child, and he refers to it, I thought then, as I do now, it was the pride of the place. And then on the right is a quote by Andy Foster, who's um, a contemporary um, architectural historian um, who regards it as an exceptional building, um, clearly showing the influences of Bernini and Borromini, the Italian greats. But as well as having these people, I also took a few little quotes of TripAdvisor and of Google reviews to see what ordinary people say about St Philip's. And there was a few nice ones. Um, somebody said, worth a trip here to see a beautiful building, the highlight of which is the breathtaking stained glass by Edward Byrne Jones and William Morris. No description do, just, does them justice. 
um, a place of worship for 100 years. Somebody else says, all was passing this area, and I still adore this church because of its architecture and structure. So moving on to the growing town. The church came into ex in existence because at that time, uh, Birmingham was in the Diocese of Lichfield. Uh, and Birmingham was a much smaller place than it is today. It was a growing market town. And the only church in Birmingham at that time, um, Church of England Church, was St Martin's in the Bull Ring. Um, and St Martin's was becoming too small for the number of people that wanted to attend divine service. And more importantly, the churchyard was filling up rapidly and it was said that the church was no longer burying the dead, but the dead were burying the church because of the large walls they were having to build around the churchyard. So the man who was the Bishop of Litchfield, Bishop Hoff, decided to go to Queen Anne and get permission for a new parish church in Birmingham. Um, and he set about appointing a group of commissioners whose job, a little bit like a steering group today, it was their job to get the church built to raise the funds and manage the project and get it and get it done. Um, we've got this really lovely plan in front of us, map plan, and I absolutely adore maps. This one is a series of plans by somebody called Westley. Um, and it, it, it was done in 1731. So it's just 16 years after the church was consecrated. Um, and on this map, you can see there's a lot of fields around, you know, it's it's a small village. And I think uh, as a modern comparison, it's possibly something like uh, Kenilworth, maybe in size at this time. We've got St. Martin's in the Bullring Church down here and St. Philip's, newly built St. Philip's up here um, on the right hand side. And you can see right opposite where today we've got um, Colmore, this would be Colmore Row now, or we've got the, all these fields, ploughed fields, orchards, we've got some really lovely little walled gardens. Um, it's really a very different picture. Um, I also like to just point out the River Ray, which is quite distinctive here, whereas it's all culverted now, you wouldn't know it was there. Um, and the moat <coughs> that goes around the manor house that would have been the home of the, manor, the, the Lord of the Manor of Birmingham. Um, there's some lovely writing at the bottom of this plan as well. And it explains that in the year 1700, Birmingham contained 30 streets, 100 courts and alleys, 2,500 houses and 15,000 inhabitants, one church dedicated to St. Martin. Um, and then it says from um, to the year 1731, there are now 25 streets, 50 courts and alleys, 1,215 houses. Um, 18,000 inhabitants together with a new church. So they are there talking about the new church of St. Philip's. Um, and uh, along, along with the, the plan, you get these wonderful prospects that were also produced by Westley, cartographer. Um, and uh, they're from different angles from the city. Uh, this one, uh, I like to think, I like to imagine that it's um, drawn from where the Blues Ground is today. Obviously the Blues Ground wasn't there then, but that's just to sort of orientate yourself, that's where it is. Again, you can see the riv River Ray down here. So that means that the River Ray separates the Manor of Birmingham from the Manor of Aston. So directly in front of us here is the Manor of Aston. And I believe this kind of fine house here is Duddeston Hall, which was the home um, of the Holt before they built Aston Hall. Um, and you can see this spire here is St. Martin's. There's the manor house again. And up here is St. Philip's Church. And it's certainly, you know, really raised up. It's, it's kind of quite exaggerated how tall it is, but it gives us a really good reflection of how the building was regarded in the town at the time. Um, just to the right here as well, this is Old Square. Um, if you know today where the Minories is and where the... Um, Tony Hancock statue is, Old Square was a really top important fan fancy address in Birmingham at that time. Um, I'm also going to show this um, prospect, which is done by somebody else. It's not a Wesley, it's by um, some brothers uh, whose name was Buck. Um, and this 
is a detail from one of their East prospects. And again, it shows the church very high up, very elegant, really something to be proud of, the pride of the place, again, reflecting its status. Um, this next one is um, a coloured version of one of the Wesley's North prospects. Um, and it's just fantastic. The cathedral owns an original one of these um, and it's a super piece. This, if you want to imagine, we uh, are, it's as if we are stood at the Grand Hotel looking across to the cathedral now. So directly in front of us, this muddy track is Colmore Row. Um, and just to explain, we've got these this avenue of plane trees that was built all the way around the edge of the churchyard, a brick wall, um, and these buildings that go around the edge, this one here first, is the Blue Coat School. I think it's where Nationwide is now on Colmore Row. Um, and uh, the Blue Coat School was built in 1725, um, and it was a parish school for children within the parish of St Philip's. There are two little pieces of sculpture on the front of the school and the school moved out to Harborn in 1931 and those little pieces of sculpture um, are still there at the school now just above the entrance. Going round here right next to it this is the walled garden of the rector's house and this building here was the rector's house so he had a very very fancy garden. Both the walled garden and the rector's house were demolished to make way for the um, for a uh, a channel that went in the ground in order to provide access to Snow Hill St Snow Hill Station for trains. So that was all demolished by the Great Western R Railway um, in the late nineteenth century. Carrying on round this building here is a row of Georgian houses, very fine address on Temple R Temple Row. Um, mainly um, the kind of premises for doctors and people like that. So it was a really top address and it later made way for House of Fraser. And these houses existed on this site right up until the 1950s, amazingly. Um, and later on in the talk, I'll show you a picture of, of, of them as they were then. Just down the alleyway, this would be Cherry Street. You can see down to St Martin's here. And just reflecting on the church itself, it's got a flat back at this time. Um, and we'll come to understand that this was changed over time when the chancel at St Felix was extended in the later 19th century. But this is it in its original form. I love this illustration of ordinary everyday life as well. And you can see a burial taking place here. Uh, and burials were incredible incredibly lucrative for the church because everybody get, got paid, the gravedigger got paid, the organist got paid, every, everybody earned something. So um, they tried to get as many in as they could and again we'll be able to reflect on that later on. So um, we're very fortunate to have um, now in the archive at um, Birmingham Library um, a lot of early records for um, St Philip's. They've been preserved on vellum and vellum actually lasts better uh, than paper. So they're in incredibly good condition. Um, and uh, you are able to go to the library and ask to see them in the Wolfson room, not at the moment it's closed, but any other time you can go and do that. Um, and it really is lovely to see these old documents firsthand in great condition. This one here is an account from the building works and you can see the names of the commissioners. So if you look down here, the commissioners generally were the great and the good of Birmingham. This was signed in 1716, so I think it's the signing off of the accounts. This man is Digby, Lord Digby, a big landowner in Warwickshire. Holt here, this is um, Holt from Aston Hall. Cleobury Holt is another member of the Aston family. Arden Adderley, um, as in Adderley Park. And I was looking at this earlier. I think it says William Jesson. And Jesson's Road is where Millennium Point is now. I don't know that much about Jesson's, so it would be interesting to find out. But these accounts basically 
um, indicate the money that came into the church and the money that was paid out. Um, and I've just spotted an interesting one on here. You may know that our lovely wrought iron uh, altar rail was made by somebody called Robert Bakewell. And you can just see here, paid Robert Bakewell for iron work. There's a record of that. Um, on this one here, 21st of October 1710, so five years before it was finished, this is very much in the building stages when work is going on. Um, and some of you may know that there's this sort of legend that goes round that Elizabeth Philip, the land on which the church was built, was owned by somebody called Elizabeth Phillips. And it's said that Elizabeth gave the land for free. Well, if we look at these records here, let me see, where is she? Phillips paid Mrs. Phillips one year's rent. Um, and I did a quick calculation and worked out that she's paid 500 pounds, equivalent 500 pounds um, for, for her rent for that year. So that rather changes that view, I think. Um, other interesting pieces in here is that Andrew Archer was paid towards getting stone. Um, and as you probably already know, and I will say it as well, is that the Archer family um, were very much connected with the church and Archer was a commissioner. So as well as being commissioner, he also got paid as well for some stone because the stone came from a quarry near where he lived. Um, another one down here I like is William Pickford towards stone and loading. And I've tried to dig around on this and I haven't got conclusive proof, but I think that that Pickford may well be some um, ancestor to our big Pickford's removal company that exists today. So that's just a nice, nice little aside. So as I said, the architect of St. St. Philip's Church was this gentleman, Thomas Archer, an archer was a Warwickshire lad. He lived in Umberslade Hall, which is this building down here on the right, which is near Tanworth in Arden in Warwickshire. It's flat today, so um, it's still preserved. Very lovely, elegant home. Archer had been on the Grand Tour of Europe. He went to Cambridge University and he worked for Queen Anne. So he was um, very much a kind of member of the gentry. Um, when he went to, um, when he went around Europe, where he went for four years as well, he spent a lot of time in Rome and he was particularly impressed by the kind of later 17th century work of Borromini and Bernini that he saw there. And the image on the top right here is um, the church, and I can't remember the name of it uh, off the top of my head, but it's in Piazza Nirvana in, uh, in Rome. And you can very much see lots of influence in this for St Philip's as well. You know, the kind of balustrading that goes around here, the little cupola, um, this kind of tower as well. It's a very sort of chunky tower compared to ours, but nonetheless, it still has a, a lot of similarities. Um, <clears throat> Archer, um, Archer's commission at St Philip's was his first church commission and to get church commissions was a bit of a coup really so it was really what you wanted to get as an architect he had worked on a lot of other big estates in um in in the country um for example he worked on this building on top right here which is the cascade house at chatsworth and he worked at rest park as well but after getting the commission at st phillips which he no doubt got through his connections with his brother andrew archer he then went on to um, design two more churches both of which are in london the one on the left here is um st paul's in deptford uh, and it's it, um, if, if you Google it, you'll see that it's located in a really beautiful um, avenue. It, its context is really, really lovely. And this one on the right hand side here is St. John's St. John's Smith Square, London in the um, borough of Westminster. Um, and that church is now a concert venue. And if you're in London and it's non-COVID time, it is really worth go going to see. Lots of similarities with St. Philip's um, as well. 
we're really fortunate to have the drawings of St Philip's um, and that's the image on the left hand side <clears throat> uh, and the reason that they have survived is was because in 1734 um, they were included in a book of Baroque architectural drawings that were put together by somebody called Colin Campbell. It's called Vitruvius Britannicus. And as you might expect, there are um, designs for the big estate country houses in the country, um, as well as, you know, really sort of established towns like um, Edinburgh and London. So it's very significant that but that Birmingham is included in that collection. Birmingham was just a small, fledgling, flourishing, but ambitious little town. Uh, and it tells us a lot about, you know, the people of Birmingham at that time. So we're lucky to have those images. And you can see that if you look at this image on the right hand side here that was taken by Richard Postel a few years ago. It's a great picture because it's very difficult to get the entire building in. I'm sure Robert, you know that from your experience of photographing it. Um, but um, he's managed to get the whole um, elevation in. You'll spot a couple of distinct differences. Um, one of them is this, this little feature here that's on the dome is not been included. Um, don't know why, whether that was some sort of window, I I'm not sure at all. But also more significantly, this kind of semicircular ped pediment that you see on um, the building today is not included. Um, and it's believed to be the reason for that is because when the church was um, consecrated in 1715, it didn't have a tower. The tower, it was incomplete. They hadn't got enough money to put the tower on. So as a way to give it an, a sort of impression of being finished, um, we believe that this little pediment was put on and then the tower itself would, was added uh, about nine or so years later. So key features of Baroque architecture um, <coughs> are the use of um, concave and convex. So particularly seen on the tower here, you've got these, these lovely concave um, elevations. You've got the beautiful scroll work. You've got the distinctive dome with the cupola above and the elaborate iron work. There's the balustrading that goes all the way around. The appearance of urns on the balustrades. These grotesque figures that you see within the stonework. Um, the distinctive kind of classical egg and dart pattern here. Um, on this carved bit of stone as well. And I always like to spot this, this stuff, which you probably remember what it is. It was used to keep the um, starlings off the um, cathedral. And it was put on there in the 1980s and recently taken off when a lot of new stonework was repaired. Um, but look at it, doesn't it, look, it looks horrible, doesn't it? Um, so the tower was incomplete and thankfully um, somebody called Richard Goff went to um, the monarch who by then was George I in 1725 and got um, funds to complete the tower um, and he was given £600 and with that money they were able to add the tower on and then as a thank you to um, Richard they included a boar's head in the weather vane, which is from the uh, Calthorpe family crest as a kind thank you to him. So very hidden from people. I was really fortunate when I first started working at the cathedral and we were having the weather vane regilded, you probably remember, and I went up in the cherry picker and uh, took this photograph. Um, and I can tell you, my knees were going mad, you know, 10 to the dozen. It was very scary, but also very <laughs> thrilling. Um, and uh, so very peaceful up there as well. It was amazing. So moving through our chronology, um, in the 18th century, St. Philip's was a very fashionable place. Birmingham was growing rapidly and it had this wonderful reputation as being a town of free speech and industrialization. It was a really exciting place to be. And St. Philip's was at the heart of all of this. It became um, you know, an Im important place for worship, but also an important place for social gatherings as well. 
this gentleman on the right hand side here is Dr. John Ash. This is a portrait uh, recently acquired by Birmingham Museums. John Ash had um, premises, he was a, a practicing uh, doctor, had premises on Temple Row. Um, and he was really worried about the fact that this growing town of Birmingham had no decent general hospital. So in order to raise funds for a new hospital, he started these music festivals at St. Philip's. They were called the Birmingham Triennial Music Festivals, started in 1764. And they're thought to be some of the longest running um, music festivals in the world because they carried on, not at St. Philip's, but at the Town Hall, right up until the early part of the 20th century. Um, and the um, concerts were so successful that he very rapidly made enough funds for the General Hospital. And after that, the concerts just kept happening uh, and they became so popular that in the end, in the early 19th century, they decided to build the town hall as a dedicated venue for concerts and public performances. Some of the other uh, people that we've got on, on the page in front of us, uh, the, first of all, this little um, a page from the parish records shows the baptism of Matthew Bolton. So, you know, a really important Birmingham son. You can just see it there, September the 28th, 1728, Matthew, son of Matthew Bolton. Um, and the father, Matthew Bolton, had um, a business at Snow Hill uh, where he was rolling metal. So he was born there. He actually had a pew at St. Paul's. So we don't think that he worshiped at St. Philip. But this gentleman worshipped at St Philip's and he is William Small. He was also a doctor, had premises on Temple Row and prior to coming to Birmingham he had uh, lived in Maryland and he was he taught Thomas Jefferson uh, who went on to be third president of the United States and Jefferson when asked who his most inspiring teacher was referred directly to, to William Small. So, you know, a very influential individual. When he came to Birmingham, he was the person that really set about setting the Lunar Society up. He was instrumental in bringing together all those different great minds and encouraging them to meet regularly. So he was a really important person. He was buried, he died of smallpox um, and was buried at St. Philip's. Um, we don't know the location of his grave, there's no marker for it, but in recent years, as you know, in the floor within the, the West Tower, there is a plaque in the floor now that refers to William Small. This other gentleman here is quite interesting, John Baskerville. We know that Baskerville was a church warden at St Philip's, so, you know, ver a very prestigious role, still is today, but then it was a very, very important, well-known role in the town, and it carried with it as much civic duty as, as much sort of religious duty. Um, and later in life, he very much said that he was an atheist, and he, you may know the story about Baskerville, forgive me if you've heard it before, but he was, he's been buried three different times. So um, he, he had a home um, where Baskerville House is today. It was called Easy Row up, up there in Centenary Square. And um, he wanted to be buried in a lead coffin so his body would be preserved. Um, and it was remarkably well preserved. Um, it was buried in the ground. And when they came to put the canal in up there, they found his body. And it was so remarkable in such good condition that they decided to put it in a local church, which was Christ Church. And people came to visit the church just to look at Baskerville's body and go, oh, wow, look how well this is preserved. Um, but quite quickly, it started to deteriorate. Um, and so eventually he was buried in um, Key Hill Cemetery, um, which is known as um, a burial ground for people who aren't Church of England members. So interesting that he had been a warden, at, a church warden at St. Philip's. His wife, interestingly enough, was, was buried at St. Philip's and her name is Sarah Eaves. Um, her, her memorial stone had been on the exterior of the church but was moved and is now very, very hidden, often just covered in leaves, 
right over by where the town hall memorial is. So every now and then I go and I sort of just uncover the mud because she was really the power behind it. And she was at one time his housekeeper and then they got married. Um, and she was thought to be a really important um, influence on his printing business. So moving into the 19th century, and you'll have all seen this image before, but it's just so lovely. The image on the top is an oil painting by um, Samuel Lines, uh, and it is a view from St. Philip's Church, painted in 1821. Samuel Lines had um, a business. He was a, um, he did life drawing classes. He was an artist um, on Temple Row. And the blue plaque to Lines is still there. It's just on the right of where the old joint stock is. Um, and he knew that this portion of land where my cursor is was just about to come up for lease. So he, uh, it seems like a very modern concept, but he went and captured what he saw in front of him, not with an iPhone, but with, you know, his paint box. Um, and so we've got this fantastic snapshot of Birmingham in 1821. You can see the churchyard just in front of us here. This is Temple Row. This is Colmore Row. This area here where my cursor is, is where you would find the council house and um, the town hall today. This church is Christ Church and Christ Church was built in 1830 and demolished about 1899 and quite a lot of the memorials from that building are now in the west tower so when you go down the stairs to the undercroft all those memorials that are on the wall came from Christchurch originally um, down here this is New Street and this is the Theatre Royal on New Street um, just over here is where Edward Byrne Jones was born but you can see the town of Birmingham on the cusp of major industrial development that we see later. See how I'm doing for time. Lines is a very interesting character. I often talk about him in my talks because I just find him very interesting. He came over from Coventry to work as a Japanna in the jewellery quarter um, and he was working in industry, had an apprenticeship, but very much had this real sort of burning ambition to be an artist. Um, and he did become an artist. He was the founding, one of the founding members of the Royal Society of Artists, and he started the first life drawing classes in Birmingham. All of his children were incredible artists as well, and the museum's got a great collection of all of their works. Just to give you a comparison to Lines' uh, painting, this is the same view taken in 2014 when I first started at the cathedral. So you can see that incredible change in what we're talking, 200 years. Um, and you can just see the top of the, the new library there. There's the council house, town hall, Alpha Tower. This building has since been demolished and I think it's even higher and taller now. So it would be really great if we could get a more up-to-date image, I should ask. Steve to go up and take one for us sometime. But the lead work up on the cupola is completely covered in graffiti, as you can see on the bottom right there. So I referred to Sarah Eves, Baskerville's wife's um, memorial stone being on the side of the, of the church. Um, and this image shows you how the church was completely covered in memorials. In the central library, there are four large books that have got these very early photographs on. I think we're talking about 1860s, 1870s here. And um, it's so great that they kept a record of them. But a lot of the memorials that are in the churchyard and in the church and in the cathedral were on the outside of the building. And what's also interesting in this image is you can see how bad the stonework was. And that's the reason why these memorials were removed because the entire stone of the church was replaced between about 1860 and just after the First World War. The stone was from Andrew Archer's quarry, as we know, and it's Warwickshire stone. And Warwickshire stone is very, very porous. It's not, it's not good stone at all. 
uh, and it easily erodes in the weather and you can see really how poor it is. The stone that we have on the outside of the cathedral now is a Hollington white sandstone and it's used on lots and lots of church buildings because it's so hard wearing. I also really like the scaffold as well, can you see, just made from trunks of wood and rope. It's lovely. So moving on with our chronology, this is um, on the left hand side, it's an image called a bird's eye view of Birmingham and it was 18, I think it's 1890 and it gives this, this amazing elevated vision of Birmingham and you can see all what we were looking at in 1731, all those fields, now factories and smoke um, surrounding the town. This is St Philip's just here, this is Christchurch, this is the um, Museum and Art Gallery. There's no extension, you know, the bridge that goes off, that's not been built quite yet. That was about 1914, I think. This is the School of Art here. The old library, um, as it was, and um, the town hall. This is an image of Christchurch, which was demolished to make way for Victoria Square. Um, a big Gothic building, and it was a daughter church to St Philip's. Um, and also above is the what we call the Christchurch fountain. So this fountain had been located at Christchurch, and it reminds us that in the 1830s, Birmingham still had no decent access to drinking water, um, and that all changed when Chamberlain set up his link to the Elam Valley and changed it for all of us. Thank goodness. In 1905, Birmingham by that time was actually within the Diocese of Worcester and Birmingham itself had changed enormously in that time and as well as being um, very much industrialised, there was also a lot of deprivation and a lot of poverty in the city as it was a city then, became a city in 1889. So the man that was the Bishop of Worcester was somebody called Bishop Charles Gore, and he decided to create a new diocese of Birmingham. This is Gore on the right hand side, a very small man. Um, the uh, bronze statue was put up within his lifetime, um, three years after he was no longer the Bishop in Birmingham. Um, and he felt very strongly about improving the lives of people um, in Birmingham. Uh, and he really wanted a stronger Ang Anglican presence. He was a, a Christian socialist and he had lots of really, you know, uh, good valid beliefs. Um, was thought to be a very, very good man. Um, and that was in 1905. There is a story about the, uh, there being a number of churches that were sort of like up for election, if you like, to be the new cathedral. Um, and even though I've heard that mentioned many, many times, I've never actually seen anything kind of written down that convinces me about that story. Um, I'd love it if it was true, but I imagine that the reason that St. Philip's was chosen was something to do with the fact it had these fantastic windows in it that we'll talk about on Saturday. Um, it possibly was in an influential part of the city, you know, it was within the kind of growing um, part of the city, there were a lot of changes going on, it would have been a very good location, and no doubt it had um, a wealthy congregation at the time as well, and we know that because of, of Emma Villas-Wilkes um, and her benefacting, uh, so that's probably why. Moving on to 1914, um, and this interesting uh, event that happened in Birmingham. Uh, the suffragette movement in Birmingham was, um, was in full swing in 1914 and Birmingham is known as the place where suffragettes that were imprisoned in Winston Green were force fed and there were quite a number of sort of militant acts by suffragettes because the suffragettes really upped the ante in terms of violent acts at this time. Um, they'd um, burnt down Northfield Library and they'd carried out an attack on ha in Hansworth Park um, and then they went on to carry out an attack at Birmingham Cathedral. There are two newspaper reports that I've found. The one on the left is written in a Birmingham newspaper and it's very small and the one on the right is in this Bristol newspaper and it's much more descriptive. It's really interesting to look at it and um, the, the women managed to get in 
and um, after evening service, I think, um, and they used white enamel paint to put slogans on the door to the vestry and on one of the Burne Jones windows. And I can only assume it's the last judgment window because that's low enough to be able to reach, but I don't know, we've got no evidence of it. Um, but I just like some of the language that is used. People were very, very unhappy about what they did. Um, it says here, many people who attended evening service yesterday out of curiosity were surprised to find that every trace of the attack had been removed. The air, however, was redolent of the fumes of turpentine that gave evidence of the method in which the militant message had been so quickly obliterated. And the story goes that the vergers very quickly removed this um, paintwork with um, with terps, and um, it, you know, regardless of your view on whether that is a good way to to make your point or not, the um, attitude in the in the city to the suffragettes really changed when they were seen to attack a building of faith, and there was a big backlash to them because previously people had been fairly sympathetic to their cause. Moving rapidly on, um, in 1939, the iron railings um, around the outside of the um, cathedral were removed for the war effort. And uh, this is a photograph that I found within the kind of male archives that shows that happening. We know that in 1940, um, Birmingham was under a lot of attack because of the number of munitions uh, factories in the city and um, Birmingham Cathedral uh, had an incendiary bomb dropped on it in October 1940 and a lot of damage occurred. Um, and we also know that at that time the Burne Jones windows, the great treasure, had been removed to a slate mine in North Wales. So fortunately they escaped damage. Just realise that I'm not talking quickly enough or I'm talking too much I should say. Um, so going on to the churchyard, Two contrasting images here in front of us. Top left is an early one of the exterior. I mean, you wouldn't get a dog on Colmore Road today, but it's a lovely image. Um, and this boy playing with the little metal hoop on the road is on the cobbled street. We can see the avenue of plane trees still in existence and the brick wall around the outside. And the one on the bottom there shows um, the, uh, the cathedral when it started to um, be uh, remodelled as cathedral gardens, which happened in 1911. So the churchyard was, um, was closed to the public, closed to burials, I should say, in 1858, because it was very full. There were 60,000 burials within it, but it was also very unsanitary. Um, and there were all these kind of Victorian inspections happening in schools and different places, factories, but they were also inspecting churchyards as well. Um, and St Philip's was one of the many that were completely closed down. Um, so this change in uh, sort of use, if you like, from being a place of burial to being a place of recreation was continued by the fact that it became Cathedral Gardens in 1911. Um, and from that point onwards, as well as there being burials and gravestones, there were also kind of civic statues. Um, when, they, when they remodeled it, you can see from the image bottom right, they included benches, paths, flower beds. It was really much, much busier than it is today. I think it's quite amazing, that picture. Um, this is the image that shows those houses that I was talking about where House of Fraser is now um, that were demolished in the 1950s. Um, and there are a number of really interesting uh, things within the churchyard. This particularly, was the largest is the Burnaby Memorial made from Portland stone. It's the tallest obelisk. Um, and it's to this gentleman, uh, Frederick Gustavus Burnaby, who was um, a traveler, an adventurer, spoke numerous different languages, was six foot four of great physique. Um, and I always love Nigel Hand's description of him as the David Beckham of his day, which I love. Um, the portrait that, of him that you see is by Tiso, it's done in 1870. Um, and he's surrounded by books and maps.
ropes and the paraphernalia that he wore because he was a member of the um, of the cavalry. Um, he went up against Joseph Chamberlain um, as a Tory MP and he was unsuccessful in 1880 and 1885, but apparently he gave him quite a good run for his money um, and has been forever um, memorised in, in the cathedral churchyard. The other one as a complete extreme, this is not listed, the other one is listed, this is the very small headstone of Nanetta Stocker and it says that she was age 39, the smallest woman ever in this kingdom, possessed with every accomplishment only 33 inches high, a native of Austria. Nanetta Stocker was a beautiful singer and a piano player and she featured, she's a bit of a celebrity, and she featured at the Onion Fair that happened in Aston every year. She was from Austria um, but must have died while she was in Birmingham and hence was buried at St Philip's. She was a, very, a woman of very short stature um, and th this headstone, people are very, very fond of this, you get a lot of people talking about it. Um, you're probably very familiar with this one, which is the um, pub bombings memorial stone. Um, still a very raw event in Birmingham's history, 21 people killed and 189 people injured. Um, still nobody has been brought to justice for it, but the cathedral still holds a memorial service every November for those. Town Hall Memorial. The, there were two gentlemen, Heap and Badger, who were Welsh quarrymen, who were working on the town hall when it was being built in about 1833. Uh, and they were using a block and tackle to lift a very heavy load and this collapsed onto them and they both died as a result of their injuries and their co-workers were so um, devastated about this that they clubbed together in order to build this really stunning um, memorial stone which is in the cathedral in a very odd position right next to um, a railing um, and so it's often quite difficult to see the front of it but if you have a look at it you'll see that one of the gentlemen was 89 years of age when he was working on the town hall which is just incredible. So whizzing into the interior uh, there were significant changes to the interior um, of the church um, brought about in some way or other by this, these combinations of people um, in the 1880s. So we've in the centre there, that is Henry Bowlby, Bishop Bowlby, and he was um, the rector, but also the Bishop of Coventry at the same time in, uh, at St Philip's um, at this time when a lot of changes happened. The changes happened not on a whim, but because of the Oxford movement. The Oxford movement really changed the way people were worshipping um, and worship became less plain. It became um, much more uh, focused on the Eucharist, much more focused on music and on ceremony and on symbol and representations of uh, Bible stories through Christian art as well. So we see this big flourishing, this kind of religious revival in the later Victorian period. Um, and very often with that, we see architectural changes in churches and St. Philip's is no exception. Bowlby employed an architect and this is the architect. His name is Chatwin and Chatwin went on to um, commission um, four stained glass windows. Uh, and the people that produced them were Edward Byrne Jones, Birmingham Bourne, top left here, and William Morris between them. Much of this work was funded by this lady here, whose name is Emma Chadwick Villiers Wilkes, who was a great fan of St Philip's and very ambitious for the church and what it might achieve. But I'll talk more about the windows on Saturday. This is our earliest image of the uh, interior. It's 1832. It shows things to look for is this triple decker pulpit, these low stools here, pews, uh, a, shallow, a shallow apse, not a big chancel that we have now, no stained glass. Um, I like the, uh, the flagstones here, they look like black and white flagstones, not what we have now as well. But then there are other reflections of what there is today, these um, oculus windows that we have here. 
And in both of these images, the light is a really important feature. Um, and we know that today that people come into the cathedral and say what a light building it is. Originally, the organ was located in the West Tower. And this image on the left hand side shows it in, it's the only image that shows it in its original location. So this is an 18th century image. So this is where the tower is today. And that is the way that we go down to the undercroft. This is um, the, where the font was located in the 18th century. And um, Chatwin carried out a number of, of changes to the building. He moved the organ from the back to the front and he created this large chancel with choir doors and columns and stained glass windows in order to create a much more sort of theatrical space. It would have been an enormous job just moving the organ itself. It's quite incredible. Um, and this is the organ in its current location. And I've included this image here just to remind us that those pipes were regilded because I look at that and I think, goodness me, that can't be 18th century, but it's, it's had a lot of work done on it over the years and it needs constant maintenance. So this is a more recent image, um, so don't be completely confused about it, but um, the uh, columns were marbled in the 1980s um, and this sort of wooden altar rail was added at that time. Um, and also after Chatwin's work, I think the pews were still in existence then. I've included these two lovely images and they're both Steve Purvis's images, he takes some great photographs um, of the cathedral and this shows the interior of the tower and it looks like the inside of a helter skelter uh, and it feels like it as well. It's very rickety and wooden and dusty and little changed. It's full of graffiti and loads and loads of different people who've worshipped or worked at the cathedral over the years have made their mark. It's not a great image but the one on the right hand side shows you the words Robert the Devil and it says the Saint Ledger um, and uh, Steve and I did a little bit of research into Robert the Devil and he was a well-known incredibly successful horse um, who uh, kind of competed in just for a couple of seasons in, 19, in 1880 and 1881. So one of the vergers must have felt very strongly about putting some money on this horse and maybe had a win and so have put his name up in the, on the door to the clock face, that's where that's located. This is an image from 1950 and it's how the cathedral was decorated for the Festival of Britain in that year. So you can see all the flags up here and you can just make out our altar rail, which is now further back towards the high altar. But for a very long time, this Baker altar rail was here right up until the 1980s. These, this is my last slide, just to reflect on some of the treasures within the cathedral and some of the things I like. Top right here, can you see it's saying Frankie Netball or not? No, no, that's okay. I'll just click that off. Top right is um, the Bakewell, um, wrought iron altar rail, very beautiful, very decorative. Um, unusual actually, because the rest of the church was so simple in the 18th century. Uh, this uh, next in chronology is the 1905 cross by John Paul Cooper, who was the head of the School of Jewellery at the time. Um, and no doubt he was given this commission as the church changed to be a cathedral. It's made from hammered brass, um, and it's covered in semi-precious stones. It was restored and put back on display in um, the tercentenary year in 2015. Top left is the crucifix that's in the north aisle and it's by a well-known Christian artist called um, Peter Eugene Ball and he uses found objects in his art. So he's mounted, um, so the cross is on um, sleepers, railway sleepers, and he's used found old wrought iron nails. Bottom left is our font, and it's made by a um, sculptor called John Paul, a Birmingham sculptor. And he's also the man that did the lettering for the Burne-Jones inscription in the floor in the West Tower. 
And this one on the bottom right here um, is just one of the four gospel door handles. And I'm really not very sure when these came in. And Graham, I don't think they're in the inventory. I've never seen any reference to when exactly they came, they came into the cathedral. But they represent the four gospels. This particular one, the lion, is St Mark's gospel. There's a man which is which is on the inside, and that is St Matthew's. The ox represents Luke, and the eagle John. I want to thank all these people, some of which are listening, for their um, images and research. And this is the end of my whistle stop tour of Birmingham. <laughs>